about the latest on the coronavirus and this Delta variant. Joining us now is Dr. Neha Narula with Stanford Healthcare to talk a little bit more about it. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Talk a little bit about these breakthrough cases because the thought pattern was if you're vaccinated, you're okay. And now we are hearing more and more about these people that end up getting COVID even though they're vaccinated. Yes, um, so the Delta variant is now becoming the dominant strain here in the country. Um, we're seeing it now in almost all 50 states. Um, and we know from the UK, from India, um, that it is more transmissible. It's more transmissible indoors, it's more transmissible outdoors. Um, and while we are seeing majority of the cases happening in our unvaccinated populations, we are seeing some breakthrough cases, although much uh, at a much much um, smaller and uh, a rare rate um, than our unvaccinated individuals. Um, we have data coming out from several states, including Missouri, which it's uh, the Delta variant has hit very, very hard, um, showing that 99% of the cases are in the unvaccinated individuals. 98% um, of hospitalizations, and then another 99.6% of deaths are in the unvaccinated group. So yes, we are seeing some breakthrough cases, but it is a very small number. Um, the vaccines are still very effective and our best um, protection against this variant. Um, unfortunately, they're not 100%, but they, do, they are doing a great job at protecting us um, from these severe cases from hospitalizations. Um, and most of the people that are, that are getting these breakthrough infections are very mild um, and managed outside of the hospital setting. So a vaccinated person could get COVID themselves and could they also spread it conceivably? Um, it's possible. Um, yes. So again, the vaccines aren't a hundred percent. Um, what they do protect against is our severe infections as well as our hospitalizations. Um, and the rate at which it's transmitted again is lower in a vaccinated individual. Again, all of this is changing because the variants are, um, rising so quickly. Um, and so we are learning more and more about this. Well, that's one question for you. I mean, how confident can we be? with the data when it is changing so very quickly. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's, that's, uh, that's the thing we've seen this past year and a half is that we are studying this in real time. Um, we know we can extrapolate from um, our studies in the past in other viruses as well as um, our studies here continuing um, to see that yes, there are breakthrough cases as there will be, this is expected. We know these vaccines are not 100%, but what we're trying to prevent is those hospitalizations, the deaths that are preventable. And that's what we are seeing. The vaccines we have right now are very, very helpful in that aspect. They are protective. And um, at this point, that is our best um, uh, protection against this virus and also to prevent more variants from coming up. Variants arise only because this virus is spreading and we're seeing it spread most in the unvaccinated group of people. And so our goal here is to get majority of our population vaccinated. So A, we can spread, we can stop the spread of this infection, but B, also we stop the, uh, the rise of more and more variants. So somebody who is vaccinated and they go into a public place and, and wear a mask, we're seeing more cities, Los Angeles recently, going toward this back to the mask mandate. A vaccinated person walking into a, a room uh, wearing a mask, am I protecting myself or am I protecting others? Uh, a little bit of both. Um, so what we're seeing now in California, in, especially in LA County, um, they are changing their mask mandates. We saw previously the CDC did announce um, a couple months ago that, you know, if you're vaccinated, you no longer need to wear a mask. Unfortunately, this message was um, taken a little bit loosely, and we are now seeing unvaccinated individuals do that as well. And that's why we're seeing surges across the US. And so now there are certain counties, certain cities that are taking it a step back saying, hey, we need to protect everyone. Um, it's much harder to try and differentiate between who's vaccinated, who's not going to a grocery store, or going to a restaurant. Um, it is easier to have everyone mask um, than to sit there and sort out 
about who's vaccinated, who's not, and making the unvaccinated people mask. And so unfortunately, the um, vaccinated individuals are having to take one for the team in, in cities that are, are changing their guidelines to protect the overall um, uh, citizens of that particular area. Um, we know that- And, and, and potentially them, themselves, from what you said earlier. I mean, there is the possibility of those breakthrough cases that a vaccinated person could catch in a public setting. Absolutely. When it comes to the vaccines, with the level of protection that they're offering now a little bit in question, what about the possibility of that booster shot? I know Pfizer has been thinking about that. Where does that stand? That's right. Um, last week, we saw Pfizer officials um, get together with some of the top U.S. health experts to advocate for a booster shot after presenting some data that they've collected that the third booster may increase the quantity of neutralizing antibodies by about five to ten times um, that compared to the original two doses. not peer reviewed, it's not published yet. Um, and we very quickly saw a statement from the CDC and the FDA saying that we don't have enough evidence just yet to back this claim that we need this booster. Um, additionally, you know, like we, we talked about before, we have pretty good evidence that this two dose Pfizer vaccine is protecting individuals from COVID, including the Delta variant. It's not perfect, but it's doing a pretty, pretty good job. Will this change in the future? It's possible. Um, I think uh, rather than a, a general um, uh, uh, recommendation where everyone needs to get this booster vaccine, we may see it in certain populations. Um, taking Israel, for example, um, that we're actually seeing lots of great data come from there and um, extrapolating that and using that information to set guidelines here in the US because they've done such a great job about vaccinating their entire population. They recently did start rolling out the Pfizer booster shots, um, but only for the immuno immunocompromised populations. We do have some evidence showing that this particular group doesn't mount the same um, immune response or the extent of the immune response that normal healthy individuals do. So it's possible that the FDA CDC may consider this in the US, but we still need to see more evidence before possibly proving it down the road for our vulnerable populations here in the States. Right now, I do personally think we need to continue to focus our vaccine on our vaccine campaign to get our partially and our unvaccinated populations here uh, fully vaccinated and also trying to distribute this globally. Um, in order to put this pandemic behind us, we do need to continue to push the hard facts, the, real, the, the science behind this and fight misinformation that's kind of preventing certain groups from going out and getting this vaccine. So, so speaking of facts, tell us about the new Stanford study talking about the severity of, uh, of COVID symptoms when it comes to whether or not people had a prior infection. Indeed. Um, so just recently published earlier this month in Science Immunology, a group of investigators at Stanford has been studying the immune response in patients that have uh, were infected with COVID and had mild infections and compared those to those that had severe infections. Now, we know that COVID presents with a wide spectrum of uh, symptoms. Some people don't even know they have it. Some people have very mild cold-like symptoms. And then others end up in the hospital um, with severe complications. So th this target, this study was targeted towards finding out what may be the potential cause. Um, in this past year, we've all been getting a primer of uh, a microbiology, our immune system. And a lot of the news has been highlighting the antibody response. Now, um, I wanted to tell our viewers that that is one important part of our immune system, but we also have cellular immunity that remembers um, even years and decades after the initial exposure. And um, specifically within our cellular immunity, we have T cells. Um, and this study specifically looked at the killer T cells. And as the name um, implies, this is a very active form of fighting against pathogens that enter our body. And interestingly, what they found was that COVID-19 patients that had milder infections had lots of killer T cells um, that actually remembered proteins that were not just found on the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but also were similar to those in the coronavirus family, so the cousins of the SARS-CoV-2 virus that we commonly see in our general colds that we get, the common cold. 
This differed from those with severe infections. And the study found that the killer T cells in the severe infected group, they actually only targeted the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, they did not target uh, proteins that were found in other cousins of, uh, other coronavirus cousins of the SARS-CoV-2. And so that basically indicated to them, um, and, and the science behind this shows that this particular group may not have been exposed to other coronavirus strains in the past. So they were actually starting from scratch when they were exposed to um, this particular SARS-CoV-2 virus. This may potentially explain the reason why children have fared better than adults. Um, you know, we see the common cold, we see lots of kids, especially in the daycare age, um, the kindergarten age, come back with colds every couple of weeks, really, um, as they start school. And so, it, being exposed to the this family of coronaviruses um, outside of the SARS-CoV-2 early on um, likely has given them um, this potential immune response to fight off SARS-CoV-2 should they um, encounter this in the future. So okay. it's really a remarkable study. Um, it's given us some more insight into the immune system as well as understanding this particular virus. Um, and so we, you know, as always, we're continuing to learn more and more. It is uh, really a fascinating subject and how quickly it's evolving and how quickly all of you, the scientists are figuring things out. It's uh, commendable. Anything else you'd like to share with our viewers today? Um, I think that's about it. I know there were some um, uh, questions that have come up uh, within my patients as well about the Johnson and Johnson and Guillain-Barre um, syndrome um, that the FDA did highlight um, a, a warning um, that they put out saying that it's a possible side effect. And so I just wanted to let our viewers know that um, yes, we are looking into it um, You know, annually. This is something we see about three to 6,000 cases um, even prior to COVID, prior to these vaccines, most of them are um, typically occurring about four to six weeks after viruses, especially respiratory and gastrointestinal viruses. But we have seen this rarely with the flu vaccine, the shingles vaccine. And now we are possibly seeing this um, associated with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So again, um, you know, there's lots of um, information out there on vaccines. People are still on the fence. This happening is very, very rare. Um, we are investigating this, uh, the causal relationship still having COVID versus the risk of having this potential side effect is very, very low comparatively if you were to catch COVID. And so we are at this time um, still advocating the vaccines. We want people to be aware. So monitor for any symptoms if you have gotten the Johnson & Johnson vaccine or plan. And what would those symptoms be? And the symptoms um, include, so this is a uh, syndrome where the body confuses itself and starts attacking our own nerves. So most commonly we're seeing lower extremity weakness starting in the feet, the legs and kind of rising up. So you may have difficulty with balance, difficulty walking, uh, potentially loss of bowel and bladder control, um, muscle weakness, um, uh, in some people, we get it in facial um, muscles, um, so any vision issues, chewing, swallowing, speaking, we want you to seek medical help immediately. If it's recognized early on, we have treatments for this. Um, and so if that's something that you have questions about, please let us know, ask your doctor. Um, but at this time, the benefits of getting this vaccine still outweigh the risk. So yeah, um, sounds like it's very rare. Indeed, indeed. Okay. Uh, Dr. Neha Narula with Stanford Healthcare. We really appreciate your expertise. Thank you so much.